loneliness, a painful relationship, a dead-end job. Whatever prison you're in, you can find the power to break out. Reach for it. A message of hope from the people of the United Methodist Church. You okay with everything? Absolutely. Well, next Saturday, right? All right. All right. You're invited to participate in the morning worship service of First United Methodist Church in downtown Fort Worth, Texas. We now join our service in progress. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfect in us. By this we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. You may be seated. Let us join together in our prayer of invocation. Everlasting God, you have revealed yourself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and ever living reigns in the perfect unity of love. Grant that we may always hold firmly and joyfully to this faith, and living in praise of your divine majesty, may finally be one in you, who are three persons in one God, forever and ever. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson is Proverbs, the 8th chapter, verses 1 through 4 and verses 22 through 31. This is found on page 590 and 91 in your pew Bibles. Does not wisdom call, and does not understanding raise her voice, on the heights beside the way, at the crossroads, she takes her stand. Besides the gates in front of the town, at the entrance of the portico, she cries out, 
To you, O people, I call and cry, and my cry is to all that live. The Lord created me at, this, at the beginning of his works, the first of his acts of long ago. Ages ago I was set up, at first before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water, before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills, I was brought forth. When he had not yet made earth and fields, of the world's first bit of saw. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limits so that the waters might not transgress his command when he marked out the foundations of the earth. Then I was beside him like a master worker and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting in a human race. The word of the Lord. It is good to be able to welcome you to our service this morning. We are glad that you have chosen to come to be a part of this service this morning as we begin another week together. We would ask that each of you register your attendance. We have attendance registration forms on each of the rows, and if you would use it and then share it with others on your row. If you're visiting our service this morning, we want you to know how glad we are to have you. We look forward to seeing you again. We would always entertain any conversations with you about your future relationship with the church. As you register your attendance, we, if you would let us know if you would like to become a member of this congregation or if you'd like to have one of the ministers to call you. Immediately following the service, we will be having Holy Communion in Memorial Chapel, and as always, we invite you to be a part of that. Our after-church reception will be slightly different this morning in that we will be having our We Do Care Fair on 5th Street, and so the refreshments will be set up near that area. We invite all of you to go out onto the street and to look at the various displays there advertising uh, the various local mission projects that we are a part of. You will find booths there talking about our YWCA daycare program for homeless children, the Presbyterian Night Shelter, our infant formula program, the food and clothing banks. There will be information there, an opportunity for you to sign up as a volunteer or to even to make donations to these projects or simply to gain more information. Now, when I came this morning and it was misting rain and they were setting up, I didn't know if Luther Henry was a man of great faith or a little crazy, but uh, it seems that it's going to work and uh, there will not be raining, hopefully, and you'll be able to go out and enjoy these displays and to enjoy our fellowship time together. We have postponed our church picnic this afternoon. Uh, even if it does clear, the grounds are very muddy. The pool is too cool probably to swim. So we will be announcing a new date for the churchwide picnic very soon, and we invite you to look forward to that. So we will not be having the picnic this afternoon. Uh, that means that the UMYF schedule will be changed. They will be staying here at the church. They will be having their usual time from, from 5.30 until 7.30. They will have games and fellowship together and an opportunity to meet the new youth director who will be introduced a little bit later in the service this morning. Beginning this Wednesday and for four Wednesday evenings, we will be having a summer Bible study on the letters of Paul. We will begin with dinner at 6 o'clock in Wesley Hall and then the study begins at 6.30 in room 334. This Wednesday evening, Dr. Day will be leading the study on Paul's letter to the Romans. Uh, we invite you to come and be a part of this summer Bible study. 
Uh, if you do want to come for dinner, if you would call the church office and make a reservation for that, it would be most helpful to us. And then we'll be continuing on for three Sundays following, uh, for three Wednesdays following this Wednesday. Tickets go on sale this morning for the summer musical, Little Abner, that will be presented in uh, the, the last part of uh, June and early part of July. Uh, they, these tickets are on sale at the ticket booth at the garden entrance. We encourage you to stop by this morning and purchase your tickets. You can do them as individuals or in groups. If your Sunday school class or some other group would like to purchase group tickets, we invite you to do so. Next Saturday will be our first skate Saturday of the summer. Uh, this will be at Epworth Center from 1 until 5. The skating rink will be open. You're invited to come and enjoy this time together as a family. And also at this hour this morning, we are beginning a new college class. This is for all of our uh, college students who are home for the summer or even those who have just graduated and plan to stay here for uh, their, their college years. Uh, this will be meeting each Sunday at 9.30 in room 335, and we encourage you to invite any uh, college students that you know to be a part of this Sunday School class. If you have been attending our church and have been considering membership in our congregation, we would encourage you to consider joining our church this morning, and if this is your desire, you're invited to come forward during the singing of the last hymn and to make your wishes known to one of the ministers at the altar of the church. This will be during the last hymn of the service this morning. Let us now continue our worship. Let us stand as we affirm our faith together.
where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in the one God, creator and sustainer of all things, father of all nations, the source of all goodness and beauty, all truth and love. We believe in Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, our teacher, example, and redeemer, the savior of the world. We believe in the Holy Spirit, God present with us for guidance, for comfort, and for strength. We believe in the forgiveness of sins, in the life of love and prayer, and in grace equal to every need. We believe in the Word of God, contained in the Old and New Testaments, as the sufficient rule both of faith and of practice. We believe in the Church, those who are united in the living Lord, for the purpose of worship and for service. We believe in the reign of God as the divine will realized in human society and in the family of God where we are all brothers and sisters. We believe in the final triumph of righteousness and in life everlasting. Amen. special scripture lesson in the history of the Methodist people is the fifth chapter of Paul's letter to the Romans. Martin Luther's commentary on that fifth chapter, the first five verses, that was being read at the time that Wesley walked into Aldersgate as a confused young man. And as he listened to the commentary on the fifth chapter of Romans, he felt his heart strangely warmed. And in that moment, and because of this verse, in the midst of this verse, the Methodist movement was born. Reading from Paul's letter to Romans. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. We boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. Not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm reading we share together this morning is Psalm 8. It's found on page 743 and 744 in the back of our hymnals. We will read this psalm responsively and sing the response number one where it is marked. Once again, Psalm 8, pages 743, 744, response number one. Let us join now in the singing of the response. Majestic is your name in all the earth. Your glory is chanted above the heavens by the mouths of babes and infants. You have set up a defense against your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have established, 
What are human beings that you are mindful of them, and mortals that you care for them, yet you have made them a little less than God, and crowned them with glory and honor? You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Eternal God, just as each new morning your Son renews the earth, so may your Spirit renew our hearts on this new day. Even though the earth is filled with beauty and doors of opportunity are open before us, we do not always have eyes to see, nor ears to hear, nor faith to believe, nor power to appreciate. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. O God, we are concerned about our world this morning. Far too many of your people experience the ravages of war today. Far too many are living with too little to eat or too few resources to satisfy their basic needs. Far too many are divided by race and class. In our faith, we celebrate the fact that on the cross, love seemed to conquer hate, goodness seemed to conquer evil, and life seemed to conquer death. But we have not fully realized that gift yet. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, faith to believe that the gift is possible, and it is possible in our time. Hear our personal needs as we pray. Grant your grace to all who sorrow, to those whose hearts are laden with heavy burdens, to those who experience loneliness. In every deep and intimate need, may we find the strength of your presence. In the Spirit of Christ, in whose name we pray as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Our gospel lesson this morning is from John chapter 16. You can find this on page 110 in your pew Bible if you would like to follow along. I will be reading John chapter 16, verses 1, verses 12 through 15. Let us hear now the word of our Lord. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. 
All that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said, he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. be seated. <clears throat> Every morning is a good morning to be in worship and today is no exception and so we welcome those of you who are worshiping with us either here in the sanctuary or watching over television. For the sake of those who have joined us by television I would say again that our churchwide picnic for this afternoon has been postponed because of the weather and we will be announcing a new date to you very soon. And now Dr. Day is going to come and make a very special introduction to the congregation. We're very pleased to introduce to the congregation and to the First Church family our new youth minister. As you know, we had a resignation in February and we've been in the process of a very careful nationwide search. We believe to you we have brought an outstanding young minister, soon to be consecrated a diaconal minister, 33-year-old Greg Smart, comes from Florida, from Perkins School of Theology, from First Church Dallas, I introduce to you our new minister to youth and their families, Greg Smart. Uh, 
Thanks. I, I'd like to assure you that uh, my first Sunday and the cancellation of the church picnic are an unfortunate coincidence. <laughs> uh, it's not, um, I would like to say that I'm delighted to be at First United Methodist of Fort Worth. And I really look forward to helping the youth program here become one of the premier programs in the country. Um, but that's not going to happen if we separate the youth from the rest of the church. What has to happen is for the youth to become part of the entire life of the church and for the church to become part of the entire life of the youth. Now, as I said, we've set our goals high, as we should. But I think you'll see that if you help us get there, it's going to make what's already a wonderful church become even more incredible. So I look forward to working with all of you, and if you're ever asked to volunteer, keep an open mind. Thanks. <laughs> it's clear some of the best days for our youth program and for our church are in front of us. Let us continue to worship with our morning offering.
next Sunday is Father's Day as a church that fathers, follows the liturgical year. Sometimes we do not recognize Father's Day, but next Sunday we want to have a special service and a special sermon directed to fathers. The men in our families, the men in our nation play such an important role as we look to the future. Next Sunday we will celebrate together the festival of the Christian home, particularly with the emphasis of the role of fathers. Let the words of my mouth, meditations of our hearts, be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Do you ever find yourself feeling guilty? Probably it would be the exception if people were to answer that question. It would be the exception the person that would say no. Most of us, at one time or another, in spite of our very best efforts, find ourselves feeling guilty. We've spent too much money, or in rare cases, not enough. We've worked too hard, or we've not worked enough. We've taken too good a care of ourselves, but usually not good enough care of ourselves. We've done this that we feel guilty about, or this that we wish that we had done. Sometimes we're not religious enough, or even too religious. The list could go on and on if you were to come up here today and tell me the reasons why you find yourself from time to time feeling guilty. And we stand in a long tradition after all, we're human beings and we all make mistakes. And Moses went to the far land and suffered greatly because of his murder of the Egyptian. And David laid awake at night as he had stolen the wife of his neighbor. And the woman at the well grieved over five husbands. And Paul felt guilty about not being good enough, not being able to keep the law like he wanted, not being able to be the perfect Jew. John Wesley felt guilty. Particularly, there was that low moment in his life when he had gone to America to be a missionary and had converted not one single Indian. He had been a failure. He had been a, the priest at a small Anglican church and had gotten crossways with his congregation and left under the cloud of, of night. In his personal life, he had fallen in love with Sophie, but she had wound up marrying Mr. Williams, and so when he found himself on the boat going back to England, his life was in disarray. His professional life, his personal life, and now as the boat was about to capsize in the midst of a storm and he was surely to be killed, even he found this bedrock of his life, his spiritual life, his faith insecure as he was afraid to die. And he saw the Christian Moravians there on the boat quietly singing and ready to meet his faith. It was then that a year later, having made it to England and wrestling with himself, that one morning he went to St. Paul's Cathedral where he took communion. And one evening, the young John Wesley went to Aldersgate. We're sitting at the back of the room. He heard a young man reading from Martin Luther's commentary on the scripture lesson for today, the fifth chapter of Romans, its first five verses. And something happened in his life, something mysterious, something almost beyond words. He felt the presence and power of God and knew that he was loved, that he was accepted, that he was forgiven, and there was nothing that he had to do to prove his worth. What Wesley came to understand it's what is so important for us to understand is that God has already taken the first step for your, in your life. God has already laid the groundwork for your happiness, for your wholeness, for your salvation. It's up to you to respond. He's already set the conditions for your salvation. I'm not a dentist, and I don't know very much about dentistry, but I'm told that with the new technology that's come out over the last few decades, that we are now in a position to wipe out tooth decay. There should be no reason for anyone in America who has a toothbrush, toothpaste, dental floss, and regular trips to the dentist to be, have tooth decay. We have the capability in America to wipe it out. The conditions are set. They are there. It is up to us to respond and to do our part. About 10 or 11 years ago, my son was learning to swim. He was only four or five years old at the time. We lived in a subdivision. There was a pool in the subdivision. All the kids were learning to swim that summer. And he kept coming home from swim lessons at six o'clock in the morning, 
And when I would see him at breakfast, he would say to me, when I asked him, how are the swim lessons going, he would say, Bob is trying to kill me. Little four or five year old boy. I'd, I'd brushed it off. And, but this went on sort of uh, day after day. Finally, I said to his mother, we've got to do something about this. I don't know who this bully is down at the pool. I don't know who this tyrant is. I don't know who is this person that has it out for our son. Who is this Bob who's trying to kill our son, Matt? She said, Bob is his swim teacher. <laughs> Matt was just at that point where he had learned everything and he knew everything, but he had to do his part in taking that leap of faith to learn to swim. So his mother took a silver pen, pinned it on the four-year-old's swim trunks, told him as long as he had that pen on his swim trunks, he could not drown. He did not have to be afraid of the water. He went the next day to swim lessons and with everything already in place that the teacher had taught him and the practice he'd had, he had the courage to take the step himself and to do his part in learning to swim. It's just that way with our spiritual life. God has set the conditions. God has already laid in place the conditions for your salvation, for your happiness, for your wholeness, for your fulfillment. Iacocca said it was always the bean counters that got in his way. Decisions were critical in his life, but the bean counters always wanted to have all the information in before they made a decision. Even if they had 95% of the information, he said they still wanted to wait for the last 5%, but he said there's an opportunity where everything is just right and the decision has to be made. God has set the condition. We have to do our part. What we learn from the scripture lesson what we learn from Romans is not only that the condition is set for our salvation, but we have to learn down deep that God truly loves us and accepts us and forgives us. We have to feel that at the very deepest part of our being. Everyone here loves their children most of the time. Think how much you love your children. Is it not reasonable that God loves you a million times more. Think how much you love the most important person in your life, your spouse, your parents, your children, a friend, the people that you love more than anything else in the world. Is it not reasonable that the maker and the creator of the universe who is so much more than we are loves us even more? See, God does not hold grudges. People do. God does not sit around and wait and for us to make a mistake. People may do that. God does not want us to fail. God does not delight in our failures. People may do that. The central drama of the church of our Lord Jesus Christ is of this overpowering, all-forgiving, all-accepting love. It happens in baptism. The baby comes forward to the altar. The water is splashed on the baby. And there is that moment when we realize that God loves and accepts and forgives this baby no matter what. No matter what this child does, no matter what this child becomes, God is there always with that love and that acceptance and forgiveness, the central drama of the Christian faith played forth in the sacraments of communion, where we are invited to come to the table and to eat at God's table, to be one of God's royalty, a brother or a sister. I had a friend who was invited to the White House about 10 years ago, invited to the White House to consult on the problem of South Africa. Some of you may have been invited to the White House, some of you may have been there. It must be an unimaginable experience to pull up in front of the White House, to walk up the steps, to meet the President of the United States. You must feel, sitting there at a state dinner, that somehow you have arrived, that this is the penultimate. And yet, how much more important is it to be invited to God's table, to eat with God's people, to be there as a brother as a sister, as a full member of the family. Regardless of your lineage, regardless of your past, you are a part of God's family. You are holy, you are sacred, you are royal. Paul in Romans likes to use the forensic metaphor. He likes to talk about the courtroom, which we're all familiar with. And he says the trial has already been held for each one of you. He says that what truly has happened in our relationship with God is that we are called into the courtroom that God comes and sits behind the bench way on high, that the prosecutor begins to read the list of grievances against us. You know the grievances, the mistakes, the troubles, the shortcomings, 
the things you've done you wish you hadn't, the truth about yourself. Begin to read those shortcomings, but before they can even be read, the gavel comes down, sounds all across your life, and the word is not guilty. Paul says the trial has already been held for you, each of you, and that you have been pronounced not guilty already by the God of grace who loves and accepts and forgives you and chooses you to be His own. And we know, of course, that as we come in front of God and as we are loved and accept and forgiven, we know that our worth and value is determined by that love and not by anything that we can do. But we're always thinking if we can just accomplish this, if we can just do this, if we can just gain this, that surely then our lives will be okay. I was talking with a young couple recently. Both of them are engineers. A man and his wife, a young couple, going to school, and grades were the center of their life. They felt that if they made good grades, somehow they were good. If they made bad grades, somehow they were bad. If they made good grades, somehow they were okay. If they made bad grades, they were not okay. If they made good grades, they were worthy. If they made bad grades, they were not worthy. And one day, as I was, I was talking to them, it, it dawned on them that in spite of what they did with their grades, in spite of those accomplishments or lack of accomplishments, they still loved each other. They still had their same basic intelligence, the same inherent capabilities. And the, the better grades they made, the more they wanted to do better. There was always some new plateau. There was always somebody who was doing better than they were. There was always some reason not to feel good about yourself. And then they came to the realization that it is not that it is what is external that matters. If you base your life on money, there's always somebody who's going to have more money than you. It can go away. If you base your life on the law, keeping the law, as Paul learned, you'll always fall short and be frustrated because you cannot keep the law perfectly. Always somebody who will keep it better. If you base your life on work, there's always things that you cannot accomplish, that you cannot do, that you do not do as well as you wish you would do. If you base your life on a conquest, there's always another business to buy. There's always another mountain to climb. There's always something else and always somebody else who's doing so much better than you are. The Bible says that our lives are not dependent upon what we can produce. They're not dependent upon the awards and, and the honors. They're not de depends upon how high we make it in the company and what are our good works. Howard Hughes lived in a world where he accomplished enormous success. He was greatly creative. He was brilliant. He was wealthy. But According to his biographies, he, he lacked one thing, the ability to love and to be loved. No matter what he achieved, no matter what he accomplished, no matter how much he, he achieved in life, that pain was still there because he did not have the ability to love and to be loved. Marilyn Monroe based her life on external beauty. She lived in a world of, where she was honored and celebrated for her beauty, but when that beauty began to fade, her whole life crumbled. Buzz Aldrin wanted to be number one more than anything else and constantly throughout his life, whether it was in scouting or in school or in the military or wherever, he wrote a Ph.D. thesis at MIT, which is still a, a marvel, a Ph.D. thesis on space travel. He was number one in his class. He was chosen to be one of the original astronauts. And of all of the billions of people that have lived on the planet Earth, he was one of two who stepped on the moon, one of the first human beings, but when he came back home and all he had in his life was his accomplishments and his struggle to be number one, he found that that was not enough and he was overcome by the emptiness and the meaninglessness of life. If God can forgive Jacob of his deceitfulness, he can forgive you. If he can forgive Mary Magdalene who broke every rule in the back, then he can surely forgive us. If he can love Paul and forgive Paul in spite of his piousness and his religiosity, then he can forgive us. Somehow, sometimes we think that it all depends on us. All that depends on what we can do and what we can produce. And if we don't get the right result, somehow we feel guilty. That the only thing that can save us, the only thing that can make a, a deep difference in our life is hearing down deep inside that in spite of our brokenness and our shortcomings and our mistakes, we are loved and we are accepted, and we are forgiven. The good news that the Bible has for us today is that the trial has already been held, that the verdict is already in. 
The gavel has already come down. You are loved, you are accepted, you are forgiven, you are acquitted, you are not guilty. Amen. Our gathering will soon be ended. Where will we go and what will we do? May grace, peace, hope, love, and joy forever accompany you. Amen.